Hello and welcome everyone to the fourth lectures of the series titled Encountering Life, jointly organized by the Department of Religious Study and Ariel Graduate Council and sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Humanistic Buddhism, University of West. My name is Miro Saki, Chair of the Department of Religious Study. And I would like to request our President Ta, oh, President Ta, the University of West. Hi, everyone. A few words. Uh, Thanksgiving is a um, special occasion uh, to celebrate the harvest and blessing from the past year. Um, I want to specific specifically uh, thank you, Dr. Lancaster, um, for your contribution to the monthly lecture series um, and to all of you who have been supporting um, U.S. Um, and um, so I want to say happy Thanksgiving and may you have a happy time, joyful time with your families and friends. Thank you. And also thank you, Professor Sakia and the Religious Study Department. Definitely, yes. Thank you, President Da. And thank you for your support. So today, once again, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Professor Louis Lancaster. And Dr. Lancaster is Emeritus Professor of the Department of East Asia, East Asian Language at the University of California, Berkeley, and University of West. And the topic of today's lecture is compassion, a natural state of cognition. Compassion is a feeling of concern for others who are suffering and therefore makes a person one to do something to help. In Buddhism, compassion is called karuna and the idol of practice is to selfless act to elevate suffering, whatever it appears. As Dalai Lama said, union compassion must have both wisdom and loving kindness. So in today's talk, Dr. Lancaster will be offering a fresh perspective on compassion and will explain why it is so important. How can each of us live a life of compassion, of com common experience with others? So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Lancaster. Thank you very much, uh, Moroz, and thank you, uh, President Ta. It's a pleasure to be back with you all. Um, this is uh, next to the last of the monthly talks that I've been giving. And I thank you all for still sticking with it. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it's been a been a, a long year and a strange year in many ways, but it's been wonderful to be with you all, and I'm happy to be with you tonight. Well, while my grandfathers both died before I was born, my great-grandfather lived to be nearly 97. And I remember him as someone who fascinated me. He had been a, a drummer boy during the Civil War. And in my child's eye, that was, that was exciting. I imagined him leading a parade of soldiers before crowds of cheering people. It was not until I read the work of the philosopher Charles Peirce, a 19th century American who was one of our nation's great thinkers. Reading his work, I began to understand the darker side of being a drummer boy. Peirce, like my great-grandfather, was a drummer boy in the Civil War. And as he describes it, it was not a fun-filled march down Main Street. It was a serious and dangerous role for young men and boys during battles. They were at the front line and their main task through loud drum beats was to communicate instructions to the troops, retreat, advance, go to the left, stand firm, In this role, Peirce recounts 
<clears throat> that many times he saw soldiers spring to the aid of others without a moment's thought for their own safety. From this, he reached an insight about human nature. He concluded that compassion <clears throat> is a part of our psyche and under certain circumstances, it takes place without training or any instruction. By contrast, fighting and killing the enemy, says Peirce, must be taught. And soldiers can perform only after receiving training. Well, the word compassion in its most basic form means to suffer in common. Uh, we have made passion into a word meaning intention, strong desire, enthusiasm, even sexual drive. But its oldest meaning and its root is suffering. And the prefix C-O-M means together. The soldiers that Peirce saw performing selfless acts of compassion on the battlefield were examples of those who acted out of a common bond of suffering together. Now, empathy is sometimes used as a synonym for compassion, but I think it's not the best use of the term. Empathy implies having the knowledge that others are suffering, but does not necessarily extend to action. Compassion in the experience of purse was an immediate response of assistance by someone who is in the same situation. I think this is why the Dalai Lama said, compassion is only possible between equals. Now, I've never been blind. And while I have emphatic feelings for those who are, should have said empathetic feelings for those who are, it is not possible for me to fully enter into their world. It is instructive to watch blind people together. They have compassion for one another, but it does not show itself as being overtly helpful. It is respectful. I remember one day waiting for a stoplight to change before crossing the intersection. Two blind people came up behind me with their canes. To my surprise, one of them asked the other, what time is it? And he replied with the correct answer. Well, I wondered how he knew. And then I saw his braille wristwatch. He answered so alertly and I suspect proudly with the implication that one does not need to be sighted to tell the time. So when the light changed, they waited to hear the flow of traffic and then both walked calmly across the street. I have, I have no idea what it would be like to walk with a friend across a busy street in absolute darkness. They did it with no visible fear in total harmony. 
Some years ago, a friend of mine had a terrible tragedy in his life. When his 16 year old son had an accident and was paralyzed from the neck down, the young man was in the hospital for many weeks and I went to visit him. He was in a room with three other teenagers who were also paralyzed and receiving treatment. The four of them kept up a flow of dialogue as they joked with one another. I now know that it was compassion, that they all suffered in common. And they showed that compassion in treating one another without pity or reference to their body's state. Well, when the hospital released the son of my friend, the son was devastated because at home, he had no one who suffered the same. He became an object of pity someone who was set apart, lovingly cared for by his parents. But what he wanted was compassion from those who suffered with him and would joke and support him in a normal teenage fashion. When I started to do prison visitation, it was soon obvious to me that I could not have this type of compassion for the inmates because my life was so different. What I did see was that the practice of meditation and the conversations that we had together helped them to express their compassion one another. A great moment of learning for me was hearing one of the men tell of the suffering he had in the living arrangements with 200 in a large room sleeping in bunk style beds. He told me of his hatred for those other men, his anger at their snoring, their sudden shouts while dreaming the constant bright lights, the noise of loud talking. Well then, <clears throat> one night when he couldn't sleep, he decided to sit on his bed and meditate. As he did so, he was suddenly aware that everyone in the room suffered as he did. He opened his eyes and looked all around him at the men who were there, stripped of everything by imprisonment, shamed by their past deeds, frightened of the future. Suddenly, he felt compassion for them. And he was no longer angry, no longer resentful and restive. From that moment, he began to reach out to his fellow inmates. In particular, he turned to the young men in their 20s, the group facing decades in prison. It is among prisoners in this age bracket that we find the highest rate of suicide in the country. So he began to look for those facing deep depression and started sitting with them. The only thing he had to elicit their interest was a small portable chessboard. And he used to get them to do something beyond despondence. His efforts saved lives, 
and he came to be called the prison bodhisattva. Now these acts of compassion occurred in extreme situations, the battlefield, a high security long-term prison. Most of us are probably fortunate enough never to face such difficulties. So does that mean that we cannot have compassion for those who do? The Buddhists teach that we all suffer. We all have moments of dissatisfaction. We all face illness and old age. Now, as, as you know, I've reached my 90th year on this earth, and I've lost balance and walked with a cane. I found that I didn't want to see other old men with canes, and I tried to look away from them. But recently, it's come to me, <clears throat> I need to listen to the inmate who found his compassion in a room with 200 prisoners that he resented and rejected. Old men need not just remind me of my reduced bodily movements. We are fellow sufferers. So now I try to smile and nod if I catch the eye of a fellow sufferer. I am determined not to turn away and feel somehow diminished by the view of another person in my same condition. Well, when you have young children, they need to be with equals, those their own age. We say they need playmates, but it's much more serious than that. They need those who are facing the life of a child. As we grow older, we forget what it was like to be unable to do what others seem to do effortlessly, feeling small as we are surrounded by huge bodies that tower over us being bodily picked up and carried about, being told not to touch something that interests us, confused by constantly facing new things that we have never experienced. Who can best help a child learn to pick up a ball and throw it? Well, I no longer wonder why children spot each other and are immediately drawn toward one another. It seems to me that it is compassion that they need from one another. The compassion which only an equal can give. So children learn quickly from watching those who struggle with their same development. As teenage approaches, this need for friends grows even more strong. Well, we have all once been teenagers. <clears throat> we can't have the same understanding as those who are in the midst of that stage of life. Humans are in need of compassion from equals at every stage of life. It does seem that men have a hard time seeking for compassion from other men. We have feelings of competition, the need to prove ourselves as superior, the fear of being seen as lacking in strength and ability. Women also need compassion when they feel they are denied equal access to express their abilities. Who better to give it than another person who has to face these issues every day? So 
So when we think we do not face the same situation as a warrior or a prisoner or a handicapped person, it can mislead us to think that any talk of compassion is not needed for ourselves. But we have many examples of the need for compassion in all levels of society. Thousands of people have found support groups of equals, alcoholics, families of those who have become addicted, gamblers, those who have uncontrolled anger, those in danger of suicide. But our search for support need not always be from a negative perspective. Buddhism encourages meditation and chanting as a group exercise. One of the three jewels of Buddhist life <clears throat> alongside the Buddha and the teaching is the Sangha, a community of people who have need of focus and spiritual practice. When I first started meditating, I realized that the group was much more focused when one woman was there. She was able, just with her presence, to give wordless support, compassion to all of us trying to master a practice that offered benefit in our lives. But, but it takes courage. It takes courage to accept the fact that we're like many others who are in need of help. When the Vietnam Memorial was, was completed in Washington, I went to see it. Reports of its success were mixed, so I was not sure of what to expect. First, it seemed insignificant. A wall set in an indentation of an open field. However, when I walked down the incline, and the wall rose above me, covered with the thousands of names of those killed in Vietnam, it was overwhelming. I stood there with tears in my eyes as the wall conveyed, conveyed the message of how many had died. At the same time, I imagine how large a wall would be if it contained all the names of the women, children, and the other Vietnamese who had died in the war. This memorial is an indication that artists can often depict a view of reality around us in a way that allows us to see it and experience it. All of us who stood looking up at the wall that day could feel the sorrow and the pain. And for a moment, we strangers suffered together. The artist had created a space in which compassion was possible. Now in Buddhism, <clears throat> the epitome of compassion has come to be the figure of a bodhisattva. One who continues to be reborn lifetime after lifetime even though their spiritual development gives them the ability to attain nirvana and move beyond all contact of the world. And, 
And herein lies a problem. If the sage or the one who helps us is so beyond our level, can they truly help us? Can a bodhisattva still be an equal when they have attained such superior insights and abilities? <clears throat> well, this problem was noted by Buddhist thinkers and some suggested that the mechanism for maintaining rebirth as a possibility required that the bodhisattva had to continue to have delusion or some aspects of normal human experience. Only in that way can they have the ability to be reborn. It reminds me of the movie Mars, where one person has to be left behind in order for the spacecraft to avoid a raging dust storm and potential destruction. On board the spacecraft, they assumed their colleague had perished in the storm until he manages to create a signal of survival able to be seen through the telescopes of Earth. The problem then was time. Even though alive, the marooned person only had resources for a few months. The spaceship safely transiting back to Earth was his only possible rescue. So those on the spaceship had to make a decision. For they all understood and felt the anxiety of their friend left alone on the surface of the planet. So in an act of compassion, they turned back, endangering their lives. They were once again on an equal footing with the solitary figure in danger and facing great odds for a safe journey home. Well, to me, this story is like the Bodhisattva who's achieved a state that allows them to safely go to nirvana. And yet time and again, they turn around, they return to ordinary life, to all of the suffering of life, the uncertainties in order to help others. So how can, each of us live a life of compassion, of common experience with others? How can I teach others who may not have the knowledge that I have acquired? Or how can I give a meaningful lecture to all of you sitting in front of your computers, listening to my words, if we do not share the same life issues? Suzuki Roshi of the San Francisco Zen Center continually referred to beginner's mind. That is the practice of living in which we are prepared for any moment of experience. And we're able to be like someone just learning without reference to our preconceived thoughts. It is a difficult practice. There's high praise in the social media for such acts as thinking outside the box. But what does that mean? Can I only escape the box when I have achieved a significant level of knowledge and attainment? Is, is this the way to think myself 
outside the box of my awareness and beliefs and conclusions about reality? Or is it that I set all of my concepts aside and try to create a space for a new beginning within my sensory experiences? Can I have the mind of a beginner open to any possibility? Now this, this might be a crucial step toward compassion. When we start anew, when we put ourselves on an equal footing with everyone, even children who have to figure out how to live without decades of experience, that they can draw on to determine how to behave. If, if compassion is only possible between equals, then we have to achieve some state is just that is just like what others are presently experiencing. None of us knows what will happen in the next moment. We try to imagine the future, but attempts to do so seldom produce a, pure, a true picture of it. We're all moving into the not yet seen future, moving into the darkness where it is impossible to know where the pitfalls, the dangers, the opportunities, the delights are to be found. And this, we are all suffering in common. This is why we need friends, family, a community of support to share equally the challenges that lie ahead of us. I've stopped worrying about where I can find my equals and compassion. My equals are all around me. And at the crucial moment of taking this step into the unknown future, like now, every one of us is equal. Every one of us is a candidate for compassion. Thank you. Thank you, Lou, for the outstanding and touching lectures on compassion. And thank you for sharing those great stories. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, so let's open up for a question from the audience. Uh, please write your questions in the chat box. I have two questions <laughs> I'll put forward. Over the course of last 50 to 75 years, would you say that people today are more or less compassionate? Oh, it's, it is so difficult to compare generations. And my memory of what it was like when I was a child or a teenager, I'm not always sure how accurate it is. How perfumed have I made my memory? How much am I glorifying something? It seems to me that Buddhism was teaching about all of this more than 2,500 years ago. And we're still facing these same issues in the world today. So I don't know that we're better or worse. <laughs> 
We're just different. That's a great answer. Second question from our student, uh, our alumni, Dr. Laura Lonugin. How do I know that I have compassion? Where does the compassion come from? Well, uh, yeah, it's a good question, Laura. What Peirce was saying was those men on the battlefield weren't thinking at that moment, oh, look at me, I have compassion. I am racing across the battlefield to save my fellow soldier. They're not thinking like that. It's experiencing it. It's being in it. I think you have to say, Laura, that we have to figure out if what we are experiencing is in common. And that's why compassion can never be done by thinking, look at me, I'm such a wonderful person, look at what I'm doing. That's not how it works. It's between equals. Equals. And so I have to I have to learn how to see if those who are equal in suffering. It's not seeing it. It's just experiencing it. Thank Don't you. Good answers, Laura, but thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, next question from Raymond Cho from Malaysia. What is the difference between compassion and loving kindness? It's a very common question. <laughs> well, I mentioned him, uh, Raymond, I mentioned him by talk that uh, there are two words that people use as if they're synonyms, empathy and compassion. But you know, empathy is a new word. It didn't come into our vocabulary except through German in the 19th century. So it's not uh, so easy to take the fact that I can be aware of suffering, which is what empathy implies, and translate that awareness into action. It's like myself, as I said, I can, I can look at a blind person and feel empathy, but I can't really be like a blind person. I, I must make sure if I can that people who do share and suffer in common have the ability to be there to help each other. That's why I often praise Danny and Shirley Tam who are with us tonight. They're not equal to the people in the prisons in one way, but they've dedicated themselves to trying to help those people who are there express their compassion for the others who are are their equals in terms of the prisoners. So that we have to help, for example, we have to help children. Children need to be together. They need the compassion of another child. I can't be that compassion. 
but I can try to help children show it for one another. That's where it really works. I think that that's why I, I feel that empathy just doesn't quite cut it for me anymore. <laughs> Seeing suffering and recognizing it is not quite enough. I have to figure out how to act in the face of that knowledge. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. Next question from Lauren. What practical steps can I take on the daily basis to cultivate and grow my capacity for compassion? <clears throat> well, uh, it's like me with watching old men with canes. There's a part of me that says, I don't want to see that old man. I don't want to see him limping around. It just reminds me of how weak and limping around I am in my life. So I can, I can, I need, and I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do it. When I see someone who is my equal with a cane, that I, I don't, I give them respect. I don't try to race up and grab them and say, here, let me stagger along with you and let me support you. I don't get overly helpful. But I, I am practicing looking at them, seeing them, and if possible, just to smile and nod and somehow say, I know what you're going through <laughs> and it's very hard, but we can do it. So that's one way in which I try. You'll have to figure out something which would be the same for yourself, I think. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Ben Fung, how can we be truly compassionate even to our people that we disagree with? Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> it's like what a lot of families are facing. What are you going to do at Thanksgiving? You have somebody in the family who will not get vaccinated, and there they are. And they want to come and eat dinner with you and sit beside you and breathe on you. and what are, you, what are you going to do with that? And people, families break up and families find real difficulty because it's, uh, it's, with these disagreements, it's very, very hard. And particularly with people who are near to you, people that you love. <clears throat> I don't have a panacea. I don't have <clears throat> the ultimate solution to it all by any, any means at all. But I, I do feel that if possible, we need to be able to maintain connections, even though we disagree. And how do you do it? It may require that you have to be the one to make the effort. Even though you're angry and you're distraught and you just don't know what to say to them, You have to learn what could, what step can I take to say we're still equal. We may have a dis disagreement, 
but we both face illness and death. Nobody that we face is, is free of it. And it takes a, it takes a, you have to almost gulp as you step forward and still hold out some hope for a connection. So I don't, I'm not going to tell you that it's easy. And I'm not going to tell you that it always works. But I do think that if you are aware enough, then at least maybe you're the one to take the first step. And it's not weakness to do that. It's not being a wimp. It's a very brave act to hold out some hope for connection with someone who's making you really angry. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. Next question from Marisa. How to be equal for compassion without being lost in the suffering and cannot be objective, asking as a healthcare provider? Oh, yes. Uh, well, I know that some of you are healthcare providers. Uh, Peter and Joyce who are here, this is, and these healthcare providers, I, I'm just in awe of them during this pandemic, in awe of them. But they're willing day after day to put themselves in harm's way and to do it and continue to give loving care to people, even people who, and some doctors and nurses are having to battle with this. What do you do if you get somebody who comes in and they haven't gotten vaccinated and now they're down with COVID and you're supposed to sit there by the hour and try to keep them alive? Yes, that, that's what, care, what caretaking is. And people do it. They're heroic. They, they, they are truly showing us something that we should look at very carefully. They're, they are like what Peirce saw on the battlefield. Without thinking almost, many of them just give aid and it's probably why lots of them became healthcare workers They're able to do this they all need a trophy they need a big gold star to put over their hearts Uh, next question from Danny Tan. Compassion has no enemy. How to re reach that state in our current world? No, I think compassion does have enemies. Um, I don't think that compassion means something which is sweetness and light and I don't take it that way anymore. The more I look at life and I look at this at suffering and I look at what healthcare workers do, for example, and I look at people who face incredibly difficult things, 
Now, compassion is not sweetness and light. It's sometimes bitter. Maybe bittersweet. We have to be able, as you're saying here, I think, to protect ourselves, to be true to ourselves. Yes. And to recognize I can help the enemy. I, I, had, I had a colleague who tormented me for years. <laughs> he just caused me no end of trouble as, as an academic. And he died some years ago. And I, I never felt good about my feelings. I didn't know what to do with them. And then one night, I had a dream where I met him and embraced him. And after that, all those years of tormenting me just seemed to be gone for some reason. And it wasn't anything that I feel I was doing because I was dreaming. It wasn't some conscious act of being able to get over it, but um, even, even with those who are the troubles in our life, we still need them. <laughs> and they need us. Thank you. We have, we, we have a lot of questions, but uh, because of limited time, so I will take one more question. Yeah, one more. I'm sorry, you're running out of time. Sorry, sorry for that. Uh, okay, so this is from Louis. Lucy, sorry. You discussed that compassion can only be given to equals, but would you also agree that it is actually possible and important for us to give compassion to people, even in different life situations? For example, extending compassion to people different than us seems vital to overcoming social societal issues such as racism? Well, I, I don't mean to say that uh, it's hopeless because we're not like everybody else. It's, but what I was trying to say um, was that uh, there are things which only somebody who is experiencing what you are experiencing can do for you. And someone who has never had the experience that you have just can't do the same, same job. So that's why I say that I think the big uh, thing in life is to not try myself to be always the one who gives the compassion to somebody who's, who's different than I am or who has different needs. But I should always be seeking for ways to help those who are similar to that person. And with my aid, they might give the compassion which is needed. That's why I referred to the prison work. You can be a prison visitor, but you're not one of the prisoners. But if you can inspire the prisoners to begin to help each other, then you've got compassion. 
That's when the compassion shows itself. Now, it's true, health workers, they're not sick. They're not like the person who's there on the bed sick. But these, what you want is you want to give support if you can. And we don't always have the support system in place. And what do you do with the people who are left behind? What do you do when death occurs? How do you help people after that? We should constantly be looking for ways to do that. Well, let, let's take one more, Veros. <laughs> Uh, the last question from Japan, Kenji yes. Matsuyama. Uh, is it necessary to sacrifice when we perform compassion? Of course, sometimes, but if you're sacrificing then it implies somehow that you're superior to the other person and you've got something that you can give to them and that it's really, if it's a sacrifice, it's somewhat different than the compassion where equals are meeting. So, if I say the only way that I can help you is to sacrifice my own feelings and my own desires and my own talents in order to help you, I don't think that's compassion. I think we need to be really aware when the Buddhists say, the first thing you need to do is to be compassionate with yourself. And if you can't have compassion for yourself, you'll never have it with somebody else. Like me with old men and the cane. I really have to be compassionate toward myself and say, Lou, it's all right. It's all right to walk with this cane. Only when I do that and have compassion for myself can I then think of ways to be compassionate toward others that are like me. And it's not a sacrifice that I'm doing. So I, I worry about the word sacrifice. Well, everybody, uh, it's been wonderful to be with you. I'm going to give one more lecture, one of one more of these monthly lectures and take a break. <laughs> uh, we'll have it next month. Uh, and Moroz, you can you can sure. uh, once again thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank Chris sure. Johnson as always for helping me. I had an enormous trouble this week. I spilled a glass of water on my computer. It wrecked my keyboard. Oh. And I lost ability to open my computer and I couldn't get to my lecture and I was just in torment. Oh no. And Chris came along and solved the problem for me so that I was able to do what I did tonight. I just want to say that was, um, that was compassion. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. So thank you so much, Lou, for your excellent talk. And, and, and thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, so the last lecture of this series uh, is scheduled 
for Tuesday, December 14, in three, week, three weeks right? at 7 p.m. And the topic is self, an active and passive agent. So please don't forget to join. And uh, I, uh, I would like to thank President Ta, Dr. Ibn Mura, Dr. Ranke, Christopher Johnson, Venerable Dees, and Venerable Srinanda Fong Sam for their support. And thank you everyone for attending and have ha happy Thanksgiving and have a good night.